Welcome to Measures of Truth, a His Dark Materials podcast. I'm Caitlin. I'm Alan. And I'm Anya, and today we're discussing the fifth episode of the first season of His Dark Materials, The Lost Boy. Episode, like all episodes, was written by Jack Thorne. Uh, William McGregor directs all of the Our World sequences, even the ones that we've had before this. Oh, that's interesting. So it's like a completely different crew. Yeah. So I didn't realize that until the credits of this episode. So I wanted to make sure and give him credit. And I guess they're doing that for like a unified look or, or something like that. Well, um, it would just be practical. if. Yeah. 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 Because yeah, I mean, they're on location, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, different locations, a whole different set of actors, except for Boreal, who I guess gets carded between the two. As he should. He should be on screen as much as possible, really. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that also just makes sense for people not figuring out that they were recording this, because mm-hmm. it would seem like it was a completely different show. Yeah. Yeah. William McGregor has directed a lot of TV, including uh, Pole Dark, if anybody's watched that. But for the Lyra universe, Otto Bathurst returns uh, from the previous episode. His next project uh, next year is Halo, which has Mad Sweeney, uh, Pablo Schreiber from American Gods, as uh, the Master Chief. That's is a that thing. based off of the video game? That's right. Yep. Isn't the whole point of Halo just to like shoot people who are the other color? No. No. It has a story. Okay. It has a very oh. involved story. It's like <laughs> okay. heavy duty science fiction. Yeah. I, but I mean, that's why people play it. They play it so they shoot the other team. I mean, that's not why me and my daughter play it. We play it for the. Because the little aliens scream. They're like, oh no, don't shoot me. <laughs> and then you shoot him in the back. <laughs> He's everywhere. <laughs> no shoot. No shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't play Halo, so I, I actually know nothing about it. I shouldn't judge. Amir Wilson joins the cast as Will. Next year, he's going to appear in The Secret Garden, uh, which I mentioned last time was uh, written by Jack Thorne. So I guess Jack Thorne really likes him. He's doing a good job in this, I thought. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, he was he's great in this episode. So in this episode, um, in our world, Lord Boreal, also called Charles Latram, Uh, spies on Grumond, a.k.a. Perry's wife, Elaine, and his teenage son, Will. Boreal approaches Elaine in an attempt to get information about Perry out of her and ends up triggering an episode of her recurring mental illness. Will tries to take care of his mom, who tells him the world is broken and good people like him and his father are needed to fix it. Meanwhile, in Lyra's world... The Egyptian party continues trudging across the not-so-frozen tundra, if you ask me, but whatever. Serafina Pekula visits briefly. She has an emotional reunion with Farter Coram, confirms the existence of other worlds, and pledges to keep an eye on them through her demon Kaisa, who remains with the group and not a goose. John Fa asks Lyra to consult her alethiometer about the Magisterium's defenses at Bullvanger. The alethiometer answers the question and then also tells Lyra that she needs to visit a village in the next valley over where a ghost-like creature is troubling the villagers. Lyra eventually convinces John Fa and Farder Coram to let her and York go investigate. Along the way, York shares the story of his exile and explains that you cannot trick a bear. In the village, Lyra and York find Billy Costa weak from exposure and without his demon ratter. 
They bring him back to the camp, but he soon succumbs to his injuries, and the Egyptians hold a funeral to mourn him. That night, the Egyptian camp is attacked by outlaws who kidnap Lyra and bring her to Bullvanger. Lyra lies and says that her name is Lizzie to try to hide her identity. So, what were our general feelings about this episode? Alan has to go before me. It's the only thing. Because <laughs> I was riffing off of him. Uh, Kaylin, why don't you start? I always think it's strange to right away answer my own question, but sure, I will go first. Oh, well, okay, or you could go last. Alan, you go first. What is happening? <laughs> um, Professional podcasting. That's what's yeah. happening. <laughs> yeah. Like when I... I think I might have been the first one to watch this one, and I jumped into the group chat, and I was like, "OMG, OMG, OMG!" Uh, <laughs> I was very excited. <laughs> <laughs> I was very excited about like the you know the later book stuff, which has been sprinkled in throughout you know the whole thing, but now it's like book two is like starting, um, which makes sense because the, it like is kind of parallel, you know, time-wise to mm-hmm. the events that are happening in book one. But it's really exciting to, like, kind of see it happen. And it's funny, too, because they, like, announced Will's casting when season two was picked up. Yeah. But now I'm thinking that that was, like, a little bit of trickery on their part. Definitely. Yeah. They couldn't say, like, oh, we hired Will for season one, by the way, because then we would be like, oh, I see what's happening. Uh, mm-hmm. But this this was, like, a very cool surprise. Overall, though, this episode is, like, a lot of plot stuff happening, and, and I didn't feel the themes as strongly. Uh, compare this to, like, episode two or three, I don't feel like it has the same kind of energy. It w- I wasn't able to sink into it as easily as those episodes, and it's exciting, but not as great as the show has been. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Alan. I thought there were a lot of great character moments from a lot of different characters in this episode, and I enjoyed it overall, but there is something about episodes two and three that were just, like, amazing television. Um, They had a lot of energy, and I just was glued to my screen the whole time. Aside from the book two stuff with Will, this section is much more faithful to the book, So we kind of just know what's going to happen more. And it's more, you know, just kind of like going through the paces to get us where we need to go. Um, But I think your point about it's not really speaking to theme as much. Yeah, it's just like missing something that episodes two and three had. And I think Ruth Wilson. Well, that's also (laughs) true. (laughs) Yeah. And those episodes felt like they just had a bit more space to breathe, I guess, in some way. Uh, My feelings when watching this episode were kind of like, what even are spoilers anymore? How do we talk about this? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) What? How? Like, I liked the episode, uh, mostly. Uh, It was good. I was generally engaged. As soon as the voiceover at the beginning started and the camera was, like, panning over something that was obviously our world... I don't know why it was obviously our world. It was just like a fountain or a pond or something. But I immediately knew what was going to happen. But yeah, like, now we can mention that that is obviously Will in the opening credits. Not Roger or anybody else. Mm -hmm. Because we've met him. And have you given in to the fact that that is the subtle knife? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've (laughs) talked about that off recording. I was thinking about this before, that we talked about this in our chat, but we never came back to it while recording that I did eventually watch the opening credits and be like, oh, no, I'm an idiot. That is very obviously the the (laughs) subtle knife. So that's good times. I guess this means that I will have to go ahead and read the subtle knife as we're finishing the TV series just so I know what's happening. It feels wrong that we haven't already read the subtle knife so that we can't talk, can't talk. What are spoilers? I don't know. <laughs> Cuz I don't even think you'd have to like read the whole thing. You could just uh just read the beginning. Well, I have a prediction fine. about how the season is going to end, but we'll talk about that in the spoiler section. So what was everybody's favorite part? I'll go first with this one. Cuz actually I've decided I thought at first that my favorite part was Yorick's um 
at the end of his conversation with Lyra, when she makes that conversation about how, or that uh, mention that she's a little bit bare, and then she sits down next to him, and he gives this look that she can't see that is very obviously full of fondness for her. I thought that that was my favorite, but actually my favorite is the name of the episode, The Lost Boy, and how it refers to both Billy and Will, and I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I didn't even think about the Will part. Yeah, I really like that too. I mean, I guess I know very little about his character. But you can tell from just watching this episode that he's not in a good place. Yeah. Um, So my favorite parts, I also really loved that scene with Mm -hmm. Lyra and Yorick. But you are not a bear. You're wrong. Some part of me is definitely bear. You'll see. I thought they super convincingly built their relationship basically in a single scene, which was super impressive. Um, And especially when one of the characters is mostly CGI. So awesome job with that. Uh, The other scene that I just loved was the one with Fartercorum and Serafina Pecola. And I completely did not expect him to just like start crying at the end. Oh, and like oh, I God. fucking started crying. It was oh anyway, yeah. That's interesting. I didn't like I thought that that scene was well done, well written. I wish it hadn't been there. Really? Yeah. Well, it just made me think about some of the things that Alan has been saying all along about how the show is depicting masculinity and letting like all of these like big important masculine characters be emotionally connected to the people around them and and like show really intense emotion in a way that a lot of stories and especially TV shows don't. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, I agree I thought with this all of was that. just a really good example of that. Absolutely. Just um it's book purist me that doesn't like it there. In the books Fartercorum <laughs> and Serafina never saw each other again. Oh, that's right. But how could you uh, I I mean, I feel like maybe Philip Pullman felt like he couldn't pull that scene off. But like as a TV writer, like how could you not want to try and pull that off? I understand what you're saying 100%. And I actually like the scene in and of itself. It's just I'm being a stick in the mud. <laughs> yeah. I guess in the book, it works for saying almost the same thing that that scene does, that Farter Coram and Serafina just can't stand to see each other. I yeah. see that they're like, it's too painful. Yeah, but I guess in a TV show, you can get that across better in a scene where they do talk about it and that sort of thing. So I never made this connection while reading the book. But I love that they made it super explicit here that one of the reasons why Frater Coram is so interested in saving the Egyptian children mm-hmm. is because he lost his son. You, I guess you could kind of read between the lines about those things in the book, but you really have to do a lot of work to draw that connection. And the show is just like, bam, no, like that's what is motivating him and it's like super powerful and super moving that is one of the things that i really do love about the show that it's not so in lyra's head as the book was Mm -hmm. that we do get to be in other people's heads yeah i i liked the effect that they had on her where she's flying and there's no like broom or branch or anything like i really like that choice i think that's very cool it looked good in the darkness i I'm unsure how it will look if we ever see it in daylight. That was like the one thing that we kept discussing in episode zero was like, we were super skeptical about their ability to pull off flying based on a discovery of witches. Right. uh, Which was also done by Bad Wolf. So this was the moment of truth. Like, did they pull off the flying? Again, it was in darkness and it was only a quick minute of it. I do think the effect was interesting and I like that they made a different design choice, but I would want to see more of it before making a decision i have i really loved um the the stuff that we get with lee here uh he comes out and says a kid promise me that this elite Thiama thingy isn't lying to you it doesn't lie i trust it too uh that was great that cracked me up every time i really love will i think this actor is like he's very strong in yeah. his performance 
some of the other kid actors have not been bringing it and he's great and then the Egyptian singing at the funeral or when they're cremating him uh, which is very sad but is beautiful and adds a little bit more to their culture you know the way that we got in episode one Mm -hmm. Um, and I really like that too and Ma Costa sings like while Billy is dying too doesn't she yeah she tells him like you can go to Radder you can go to Radder we'll be okay hush little one just breathe Mighty stars await your majesty. Hush, little one, just be. Feel the light in me, will the light in me. It's alright. We'll be alright. You can go to Rata. You can go to Rata. We'll be alright. And then she just like, ah, she just starts losing it. She sang a bit. I either way, I like how they are making singing a part of the Egyptian culture. I agree with all of that, and I also really liked that one scene with Lee at the beginning, um, which I feel like is noteworthy because I was very skeptical of some of the Lee scenes in the last episode. So uh, Lin-Manuel has won me over. That's good. I think they don't use him too much, you know, and like they do different things with him because like, you know, like after Lyra comes back, he's a little bit different, right? He's like more grounded. He's like, hey, you know, Ma Costa's got this. You gotta, you were very brave. I'm very proud of you. Uh, I love you. I'm your dad, you know, kind of energy. (laughs) (laughs) So least favorite parts. Who's got what? Uh, so my least favorite part is actually a thing that didn't happen, but I thought it did, and it made me so mad, I just had to talk about it. Um, so at the end, when we see, like, Lyra get stabbed, I thought that episode was over, and I was so mad. I, was, I thought like, that too, yeah. Unbelievably mad. <laughs> uh, I could not believe that they were going to end it on such a cheap fucking cliffhanger. There was enough of a pause of, like, black that you, or at least I, like, genuinely thought it was just going to go to credits. And then it, like, the next scene comes up at Bullvanger, and we get the whole scene of Lyra being processed there. And I was like, oh, thank God. Um, (laughs) Based on the story craft as taught by our, our favorite story expert, Lonnie, Diane Rich, you know, a cliffhanger is cheap. It basically cuts off in the middle of the action and you don't know what happens if you can, like, answer a yes-no question or, like, convey the next thing in, like, a single visual, then, like, that's a shitty cliffhanger. What you want is a game changer where it, like, it sets up something new, which is what happens, right? Because now Lyra's in Bullvanger, we know that she's in danger and she has to find a way to get out, but, you know, it's also an opportunity because that's where the kids are, so. Yeah, I really liked the ending of the episode because it it still felt like kind of a cliffhanger. But not a cheap, shitty one. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, but not like a, oh my god, was she stabbed? Oh my god, oh my god, it was like... What is she going to do now, right? Like, it has to be answered with, like, the full next sequence of the story. Yeah. Also, like, any time the main character is like, are they dead? Like, that's a dumb question. Like, no, they're not dead. I didn't like the thing that you liked, the the cave scene (laughs) with the bear. Um, I was wondering what you meant by cave scene. I guess I didn't notice that they were in a cave. I was so distracted by the charisma of the characters. (laughs) <laughs> I, th- I think there's a lot of really good stuff going on in terms of like Daphne Keene's ability to, you know, act to a character who, you know, is not what's going to be on screen. Like that's really what sells those special effects. And I think the special effects are great. Like I was having a hard time sinking into it and I was watching it with Christina and she was like pointing out thing after thing. And kind of like saying, like, I couldn't put my finger on why am I not able to, like, be here with Lyra right now? And it was because, like, where is Pan? And, you know, Pan's not there because of money. And, like, her coat was, like, pristine. There was no frost on it. It didn't look wind ruffled. Her cheeks weren't 
cold or nose wasn't red or anything like that. You couldn't see their breath. And like all of that stuff can feel like kind of nitpicky, but also this show is like very gritty and realistic in ways that like, you know, like if you watch the Golden Compass movie, Lyra's hair is like perfect all the time. But because that's like the choice that they made, it's fine. But that's not how this show is. This show is like very real. And so to not have like her hood covered in frost when she's been like riding the bear for hours out out in the cold. I don't know. Like it all those details just added up to like something is wrong here and I can't buy it. I didn't notice that at all the first time I watched it. But now that you've pointed it out to me when I'm watching that scene, all I can think is that dead seal should be steaming or whatever dead animal he's eating. Yeah. Stuff like like that. Elk, I think. Yeah, that that makes more sense because they're nowhere near water. Stock, yeah. And like at one point when she's talking about demons and how they how the bears don't have demons, why isn't Pan there? Like Pan should be there for that. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to write him in with dialogue, right? Because the whole point of that scene is that Lyra is bonding with Yorick and like having Pan be an active participant just gets in the way. Mm -hmm. And they tend not to animate the demons when they're not doing something active and talking. And I guess we Mm. could head canon that Pan was just cold. So he was curled up in her pocket as a mouse. And I'm fine with that. Oh yeah. I think that works. It's just like the accumulation of all these things, you know, like it wouldn't be like Pan being there wouldn't fix it. It's just all of these things together. Like when I was watching the scene, it was just, you know, why can't I be here? And, and Christina was able to kind of articulate for me. She's like, you know, why isn't there frost on her hood? Why can't I see their breath? Why aren't her, you know, and all of this stuff. I was like, yeah, yeah. Why isn't it that way, Auto <laughs> Bathurst? What's going on? <laughs> okay, so my least favorite thing is kind of hard to talk about because it's mostly based on the book two stuff that we get in this episode. But for those who have not read book two, Will as a character is a very smart young man. He understands that he doesn't want to be put in someone else's care. And because of that, he has to A, take care of his mom, and B, not ever let anyone know. That he's the one taking care of her, as opposed to vice versa. And because of that, he's developed in a way that means he 100% knows how to never draw attention to himself. And I think that that is a very, that is a very key part of his character in the books. And they just throw it out the window here. Like, don't get me wrong. I loved the actor. I I loved every scene that he had with his mom. Although in the books, again, he's a lot more understanding of her. But anyways, that that doesn't matter. Um, In the books, he would never get bullied because he would make sure that no one knew he was there. Mm -hmm. You know, a teacher Mm -hmm. would not know his mom because he would make sure that that just never happened. Right. And that is very much who he is. He's like, he knows how to just disappear. And this, he got noticed a lot by teachers and other students and stuff. And I get that they really wanted to drive home his outcastness. And in a way, it's hard to put on screen what I was just describing. It just completely changes who he is. I can see why that would really bother you. And I think we'll just have to see what they do with him going forward. Yeah. It's a little bit similar to when we first meet Lyra too, right? She's not yeah. this wild liar, you know, making up stories, tall tales and stuff. Leading all the children and yeah. like these big battles or whatever. Yeah. And and they did sort of bring me back around on, on those choices. So maybe they will. I just, it just seems like an odd choice to me. Also, I guess uh, Will is a character, uh, the the disappearingness of him, or like his, how no one notices him is something that I always identified with, because that's pretty much how I went through high school. So I guess I am also just like personally upset that that was taken away from him. (laughs) And I I feel like mostly like Hollywood type movies, but I guess TV in general does this like weird false thing with teenagers in, in high school, especially it gives this false impression that everybody is noticeable or or mm. if they're not noticeable, they're upset about it. Like some kids just want to coast through and get out. That's my least favorite thing. All the acting is great. And I thought a lot of the dialogue writing and 
how they included a really great line from book two and some other stuff. Really good. But I hate that they made that decision. Moving on to problematics. So while I was editing last week's episode, I got to our conversation about Farter Quorum and how he doesn't have the disability that he has in the book. And we didn't, none of us seemed to realize <laughs> that that was real bad. Right. That they just erased that. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was weird for us because usually we, we do notice these things. We dropped the ball. Kelly sent us an email about it, though. I think she tweeted at you some, too. Yeah, I saw um, her tweet. She's at Glaze Book Girl on Twitter. So she said, I was waiting to see what they were doing with Fodder Corum, but I think it's clear they aren't going to have him be disabled. It was great to see disabled actor Matt Fraser, but his role isn't nearly on the same level as Fodder Corum's would be. Yeah. Um, that character in the book is a really good example of disabled representation, and then they kind of pulled back from that. It does seem like an odd choice. Uh, and especially, like, we were talking about the scene between Coram and Serafina when he says, you know, even if I'm too weak to fight them, I am duty-bound to try. And if he had been standing there with a cane, like, not at at... Right. Like it just it would have been so much more impactful to his mm-hmm. character and to showing that, you know, disabled people have agency and ability. They I really think that they ruined what could have been a really great bit there. Yeah, I was thinking about that too during that same piece of dialogue. And I kind of assumed that the decision to make him not disabled would show up later on, like they wanted his character to do something that they didn't think would be feasible if he needed a cane to walk but i mean i haven't really seen anything yet i mean even if they did that's shitty Mm -hmm. it's possible that they decided that we're gonna see him acquire his disability i don't know like get injured or something but even that i think is kind of shitty because the whole point of fighter quorum's character is that you know he had an illness that did it to him it wasn't an injury or part of like when he was a soldier or anything like that it was just an illness did it to him you know so it wasn't even something that he chose to be a part of and and i think that says a lot about what he chose to do with his life afterwards Yeah, like the more that you talk about it, the more it just seems so shitty. It wouldn't have changed anything that's happened up until this point to just give him a cane and have him walk more slowly. Yeah, she she talked about in the email uh, Kelly did, she talked about the cardinal. Right, yes. Yeah, his whole thing about how he's like stooped over. And we actually Mm -hmm. talked about that in the second episode, but I think I edited out that conversation about how I was like, well, maybe the actor is like actually disabled. And then Anya looked up and she's like, nope, Um, which is (laughs) Kelly makes that point in her email to be like, so you have someone who's pretending to be disabled and they're evil. And that's like a, you know, like a byword in fiction all the time of like, oh, a character who's disfigured or has, you know, some kind of disability that equals evil. Mm-hmm. Father Quorum would have been the perfect person to say, you know, like having a disability is just like one facet of your personality and, and doesn't define who you are. So, or it's not symbolic of right, exactly a moral failing. Yeah, and now that we're talking about this, it really feels like they cast Matt Fraser in order to like soften the blow of getting rid of his disability. You know, which is also shitty. I like him. He's good. And he's oh yeah, no, like, he's great. I don't mean yeah. that to disparage anything that he is doing. No, I think or you're anything right, about him. It just feels that way to me now. Like we're gonna take away this character's disability, so let's just add one in on in the background. Like Kelly says, it's not at the same level. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's in the background. I think I mentioned earlier that we thought we might have a week off where we would do a feedback episode that didn't happen because of travel schedules so i think we are going to have a feedback episode but probably after the whole series is over as like part of our wrap-up yeah i mean after the season's over we're gonna have some time to kill before season two so something that 
I noticed in this episode, and I think this is just because of the visual medium, is like exactly what the witches are as an imaginary construct. I had like Anya's voice in my head of like, look at Philip Pullman writing women. Because I got so mad about it in the book. Well, I mean, you did, yeah, you did get upset, but like, I just, I guess I didn't put it together in quite this way that you have like an entire group of people who are entirely women who live for hundreds of years, but that hundreds of years life is like at their most like youthful and beautiful, like 20 something kind of look. They're a bunch of Elsa's, the cold never bothered them anyway. Like they can (laughs) wear the skimpiest outfits. Like the witches are cool. But, like, that's a big problem now that I've seen the witch and my imagination doesn't just dodge this and edit it out. I mean, okay, I don't disagree with what you're saying. But, A, Serafina's not wearing a skimpy outfit. I mean, it's sleeveless and she's barefoot, but it actually is quite full coverage. Mm Mm-hmm. Besides that. Like, the dress goes down to her ankles and up to her neck. It's, like, it's very... If you think that is skimpy... You are perhaps being a little bit of a prude. Listen, I live in the Midwest. I don't know what to tell you. No, no, you're right. No, I totally agree with you in concept that Mm -hmm. there's like, it feels a little bit objectifying or like wish fulfillment. But also, I was really happy with how the show pulled it off given the source material. Like I thought they made her look really interesting and like attractive but in a kind of an unconventional and non-heteronormative way like they gave her a really short haircut like scarification and the the like full coverage dress and i think they did the sleeveless just to demonstrate that the cold doesn't bother them anyway (laughs) can't say that any other way now yeah no there's no other way (laughs) i don't know me i i can see your point but like just because we don't ever see any old witches doesn't mean they don't age. Well, she's like, I'm 300 years old. And they're like, I, I'm older than you, like clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but they, in the books, it's talked about how they live to be about a thousand. Yeah. So they do age and die of old age. We just don't see those witches. No, oh, that's a good point. I can see how the witch thing is especially problematic given the world building of the book where all witches are female and they like all only have relationships with human males as far as we can tell, right? So it's always a relationship between an aging man and a like youthful forever, at least relatively Mm. speaking, woman, Mm -hmm. right? So that is like the wish fulfillment of like, find yourself like a hot chick and then she stays that hot chick for your whole life and then you get to be the old dude banging the hot chick but a really experienced one too yeah right yeah yeah i get what you're saying there and like i agree with everything you're saying i just want to say that in the book uh seraphina talks about now obviously it is problematic they never have this conversation in the show but she talks about how yeah we just sleep with men and, and then we ditch them because they got old and we didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, she she says that. She's like, well, it sucks for them and us. So we just, uh, we just don't do that. Bail. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, and the witches are very cool. And uh, like, I don't want to be like, the, this should not be in here. It was just, I didn't notice the degree to which they were problematic. And like, to me, and I've said this before, like the problematics when I'm looking into a story it's just all about noticing the things that you don't usually notice so that they don't have this like unconscious pull right. on you and be like, yeah, young, hot women should be with old dudes. That's good and normal. Uh, like, no, they should notice that like this is a problem. All right. So before we move on, I did just want to mention uh, somebody on Twitter sent us a quote from they did not include the gentleman's name, but the man who was like the top animal dude the animal designer i don't know something like that on this show i am so prepared for this section anyways but he said that apparently they tried out kaisa as a goose and it just looked ridiculous and very much like an animal from babe Mm -hmm. Uh. and i i guess i can see where they're coming from there but i still say a cowards and b they didn't try hard enough (laughs) 
I agree with you. I think that if you're going to fall back on that as an excuse, release the footage. Yeah. Release the footage. Like, who at Bad Wolf do we need to bribe to get the footage of Kaisa as a goose? But that to me says they just didn't design the goose right. Well, and you said last time, and I, I really, like, after you said it, I was like, yeah, Caitlin's right. That, like, the goose is a little bit weird and goofy and scary and big and strange. And, like, all of that is good. Yeah. I, I just like Serafina so much better as a person who would have a goose demon, you know, <laughs> like, especially since she, even if the book is so almost kind of prim, she's mm-hmm. like almost one step r- removed from, from life almost. It feels that way when you're talking to her, but then she's got this goose <laughs> and I love that. I think in the show, it's, um, a, I don't know how to say it, a gear falcon or something like that. Yeah, um, something like that. Yeah, it's a native to uh, the Arctic. Kaisa, see, in the book, Kaisa never felt like he was that one step removed that that I got from Serafina. He was always just like, hi, Lara, I'm going to explain everything to you or or whatever, you know, like, oh, yeah, I'll help you with this. I'll do some magic over here. Yep. Blah, 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 blah. But then when you met Serafina, she felt more removed and less willing to talk to people than her demon did, which is the opposite of everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I thought that that was really cool. And they killed it. And now it's time for Caitlin's Knitting Corner. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've built this up, so now I have to find knitwear in every episode. So I'm including this time Mrs. Perry, Elaine Perry. She's wearing a very nice plum cardigan that I didn't get too good of a look at, but I'm specifically including that here because it kind of did look like crochet, uh, just the way that the stitches. It looks like crochet, is all I'm saying. So I'm including this for Jen, our friend Jen, who does only crochet. She does not knit, as far as I'm aware. But it's really hard to talk about the knitwear in our world because it was probably made by basically slaves in Bangladesh and sold at (laughs) H&M. There was a sewing machine in this episode, too, that I noticed. Because she hid the letters under it, yes. There was like a brand on it, and I was like, oh, that's like totally different. What was the brand? Like, I don't know. It was like, it was not Singer. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. Like, I was like, that's not Singer. But then yeah. I was like, but they're not in America either. So. <laughs> oh, my God. I had a moment like that later on in the episode because there's the man who's just watching the Perry household. And when the camera <laughs> pans over to him, I was like, he's the only guy in the car. Why is he sitting in the passenger seat? And then a <laughs> second later, I was like, nope, it's England. <laughs> yeah. Is he a mailman? <laughs> Anyways, sorry that I'm right side driving normative. <laughs> uh, uh, so then we see Lyra wearing a very intricate set of gloves in this one that are very colorful and would have taken four fucking ever to knit. I'm a slow knitter, though, so maybe that's just me. And I did also just want to mention that mittens are way better at keeping your hands warm, not gloves. Take it from the Canadian. It's true. Well, it also just makes sense because then your body heat is all smooshed into one pocket not separated out into gloves uh and then at the end when she takes her jacket off at bullvanger we see her sweater that i think she's also is she wearing it under overalls yeah she had the the overalls on and then that belt with the alethiometer yeah Mm -hmm. she should not learn from moncosta's fashion sense do not wear beautifully (laughs) knit intricate sweaters under overalls Maybe they were like snow pant type overalls. Um, anyways, and the definitely the color scheme of the sweater matched the gloves. I don't know if the design did. That that this has been Caitlin's knitting corner. <laughs> Should we get you a jingle? Ooh, no! By the time we did, the series would be over. Uh, shall we get into the episode proper? Yeah, and I think we should start at the beginning because this episode starts with a voiceover, uh, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. Uh, We haven't had anything like this since the first episode, um, which actually didn't have a voiceover. It just had text with music. Witches hear the immortal whispers of those who pass between the worlds. They speak of a child who is destined to bring the end of destiny. If told what she must do, she will fail. 
but she won't walk alone. Um, I was like trying to think about why they felt it was necessary to do that again here. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. this is Kaisa's teleological purpose is to exposit. <laughs> oh my God. I don't think I even realized that that was Kaisa. Yeah. Giving the voiceover. Okay. Okay. This is weird. I've watched this episode twice. And if you had offered me money, I would have sworn that voiceover was done by a woman. No, <laughs> I mean, in a way, right? Right. Like I was like, is that Serafina? I don't remember. Sort but of. I guess. So I, I don't know what my brain did there. So this voiceover is basically just about the prophecy. And I thought there were basically like two purposes for bringing it back to our attention again to reemphasize that the prophecy comes from witches now that we've actually met a witch. Mm -hmm. And then the other, I think even more important purpose is to reframe the prophecy as relating not just to Lyra, but about Lyra and Will. Because otherwise, I think it could feel very much like a diversion to spend so much of this episode focusing on Will and his mom and their relationship. Um, Hold on. Like, this might feel weird, but this is actually crucial to the story. Yeah. And so, yeah, I guess I was just wondering, like, did you think it, it worked? I liked the voiceover a lot more than I liked the text at the beginning of the first episode. Mm Mm-hmm. And I thought it, it did lead into the other half of this episode quite well. Yeah, I I feel like it also gives us um, some kind of dramatic, ironic knowledge. Because, like, Lord Boreal, since the second episode, has been on the hunt for Grumman. And, like, mm-hmm. Grumman is, like, his way to find Asriel. And so to follow the thread here would feel like just another step in that mystery and might even feel like a little bit tedious. But now we know something that Lord Boreal doesn't, that this kid is like important. He's like, he matters in a Mm -hmm. way that Boreal doesn't understand. Right. I will say one thing I don't like about how they're doing this, and it's, it's tiny. I much prefer the way they're doing this than the other thing. But I very vividly recall first time reading The Subtle Knife, and it's not till near the end, I think, that you're like, oh shit, Grumman is Will's dad. This presentation kind of robs us of that aha yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's, it's really not that big a deal. Um, and so while we're talking about Will and that storyline, I was curious what you thought about the way that the show is presenting Elaine's paranoia and mental illness because on the one hand i actually thought the portrayal was really good and like showed a lot of the the anguish and like not knowing what's real or um and not being able to to like control her impulses and emotions but also in the story like she should be paranoid right like she's right (laughs) yeah And so (laughs) it's just kind of an interesting way of looking at it, right? Because in the real world framework, the way we see mental illness is it's like your brain is maybe like not working the way that it's supposed to. And so you're um, disconnected from reality in some way and you're like afraid of things that maybe you don't need to be afraid of or you like don't have self-worth that you should or, you know, whatever. Um, Like, the whole point of the diagnosis of paranoia is that it's, like, not real, but she should be afraid. Like, she is being followed. Yeah. (laughs) She's completely on the mark about that. And so, I don't know. Like, I've never been diagnosed with a mental illness. My perspective is probably not the one that matters. At least, I feel like they steered clear of a lot of the, like, obvious pitfalls for portraying mental illness on TV. The one thing I didn't like... Is, was Will's reaction to some of it. Um, in the book, he he very clearly states that, like, these things aren't real, but for her, they are. And he gets that. Mm-hmm. And in this one, he was very much, like, there was one bit where he says, like, when she's talking about how someone's been in the house. And honestly, as a viewer, I don't know if someone has been in or not. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Maybe right? they were just looking from the outside. Yeah. But in the book, Will, since he was very young, understood 
that these things were not real for him or for anyone else, but for his mom, they were very real and they had to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Like he never thought of her or treated her like she was making it up. Mm. Like when she says somebody's been in the house and he's immediately like, no, they're not. In the book, he would have been like, okay, well, let's check if everything's still here or something like, you know, he would have just gone with it to make her feel better. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if that's the way you should handle that. I, I don't know anyone. Who, who with paranoia so i i don't know but again i think the will in the book wouldn't have known or cared if that was the best way to deal with it as long as it was what worked for them to keep everything smooth and working in their life and to not have anybody like the whole point of will in the book is that he incredibly holy shit loves his mom you know and he will do anything to not be taken away from her and i definitely got that impression on some level yeah so did this I. episode I, I did see a connection between what you're saying, Anya, on her paranoia and the way that Will is not able to take that seriously and the way that Lyra has this intuition through the alethiometer that everybody's like, hey, come on, you can't go on a side quest. And she's like, yeah, but objectively true machine says. And they're like, oh. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like Will's mom doesn't have that. There's nothing that she can point to and be like, this is all real, except maybe those letters. And she's like, yeah, you know, you can read those now. Like, maybe it's time. That's an interesting parallel. I don't think that's a coincidence in this episode. Like, I think that part of the reason to, like, bring this in right here the way that they are is because there are a lot of connections between these two, like, points in each of these stories. I, I, I love, oh, I meant to look up her name. I really like the actress who's playing Elaine Perry. She's really good. Mm -hmm. oh she's great yeah. yeah i agree you can tell she knows that she has a mental il illness mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and that she honestly sometimes she's too into it to think about that but also sometimes she she you can see on her face that she just doesn't know if this is the illness or if this is real and that must be terrifying yeah she looks scared and ashamed yeah. and confused oh it's really good the actress's name is oluwakimi ninas Sasanya. Uh, I guess she just goes by Nina Sasanya. Okay. Um, and she's born in London to a Nigerian father and English mother. Okay. She was in love, actually. Actually. So, yeah. Um, what else we got? I really... I don't know if I liked or... I don't know. The first half of this episode, they were all in walking along some grass. <laughs> yeah. Were you mad it wasn't snowier? They I'm didn't have to film it all in Wales. Caitlin. I'm not They're mad. <laughs> not the bad, budget but I was for like... fake snow only goes so far, and they blew it all in Trollison. <laughs> okay, mad isn't the word, but I was like, this looks this looks weird. That they're supposed to be so far north, and it's supposed to be so cold, and like that grass is all very green. <laughs> Climate change is real. The permafrost is no longer perma. <laughs> Right, of course. The The other thing that I loved in that scene at the beginning was when they're talking about York. I think Lyra's talking about him with Lord Fa? Well, oh, with somebody. And she says, Your bear, you were right. We needed him. He looks magnificent, doesn't he? And it cuts to him struggling up a hill. <laughs> <laughs> They were trying to show that he was helping them. I got that because because John Fowl was like, you were right. We needed him. So I got why that. But then why the line about he looks magnificent and then eh, eh, eh. <laughs> <laughs> nobody looks magnificent pulling a heavy thing up a hill. <laughs> Unless you're effortlessly doing it. Exactly. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about Billy Costa and that whole thing, because I guess we basically assumed that they would be um, doing the same thing that the movie did and replacing Tony Marcarios in the book. I think our editor cut all that out. Oh. Yeah, because what happened was uh, I said, oh, I'm excited to see Billy die. And then oh, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. wait, <laughs> we, we shouldn't do that. <laughs> You're like, he's so adorable. I can't wait for them to kill him. Yeah. Um, Which speaks a lot about how I like my fiction, but... <laughs> oh, 
Okay, but so my question was, we so we assumed that Billy would be the one that Lyra found in this episode. Mm-hmm. Um, did you anticipate Ma Costa and Tony Costa coming along with the party? Right, because that's not in the book. Right. I, it's not. We didn't anticipate that, but at the time we hadn't even met Ma Costa. Or yeah, I guess we, we did, actually. She's in the first episode. But, you know, we hadn't gotten a feel for what was happening. Yeah. I do. <laughs> I didn't mention this last episode because it was like a spoiler for this episode. But I did have a reaction in episode four when I was like, wait, why is she here? <laughs> and then I was like, oh, it's so she can cry later. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but also, I'm glad they didn't leave all the women behind like they did in the book. No, that's true. I, I am glad she was there to see her son die. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. You know what I mean? So that we got the yeah. full impact of no, it. Yeah. Not so that yeah. she could be tortured. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I guess my other question related to that was, in the book, did they burn or bury Tony Marcarios? I feel like they burned him because the ground was actually frozen in the book. Right. You know, okay. they had they had actual snow on. <laughs> then I guess maybe this is one of those things like Alan's problem with the witches that it just like comes across much more strongly in a visual medium than in a written medium. But like I kind of got the impression that the giant funeral pyre and all of the singing was part of what maybe attracted the right. scavengers to them. Right. Well, oh. which was not a connection that I ever made in the book. Well, in the book, it's different. The people who kidnap Lyra don't attack their camp. They attack them while they're moving. Right, right. But yeah, Billy keeps fucking shit up. Jeez. Aw, <laughs> poor Billy. Just slandering the dead. <laughs> I mean, in the book, he's did alive. This, did, it wor- did it work for you guys? Like, I gotta say, like, I don't know. Like... I- For one thing, I feel like it's a little bit confusing if you don't know what's happening. I mean, Pan says, like, where's this demon? But I don't know that it's exactly clear that Billy's problem is that Ratter has been, like, you know, cut away. I feel like that information is important, and it's not clear. Well, so, okay, I definitely agree with you that it's not clear to us, the viewer, and I had the exact same thought when I was watching that scene for the first time. But Mm -hmm. the way I kind of rationalized it away is that there must be some sort of way that's beyond just visual that, like, either humans or a human's demon can sense other demons. Oh, I'm not complaining about Pan being like, where's his demon? I'm I'm saying, like, like, the information is not obvious. Like, it's not it's not not like, oh, Ratter's playing hide and seek. It's that Ratter's gone. Well, it's not obvious to us, the viewer, but if either Lyra or Pan can perceive that he's not there, that would be super unsettling. And they and so she would obviously assume that like having his soul ripped out would be a problem. But do they know that is is the problem? That's what I'm I'm saying. There must have some other way of like sensing a demon's presence or where it is that beyond the visual. Oh, that's fine. Like, I don't have a problem with that. I'm saying that like narratively, this information is not being transmitted to the audience. Like we know this because we read the book. But like the writers are not doing their job of like telling people who don't know the book that Ratter has been separated from billy and now billy is like you know lyra talks about it with lee and lee what's the word he explains it all doesn't she even say it when they're in the fishing hut though she says they talk about ratter being gone and then when they get back to camp yeah. she says something to lee about why would they do that and he and lee very much says because without your soul they can control you mm-hmm yeah it's based it's communicated to the audience through the dialogue i don't so it's like it's not always clear how she knows that Ratter's not there. But yeah, I don't, I don't care about knows. that. I, that doesn't bother me. I, I They did a bad job of this, I feel. Okay. I, I, I feel the same. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I put up too much scaffolding to make it work in my head. It's not... It's, I don't have a problem with Ratter's not here. That's fine. Like, the, that they have some kind of sixth sense about it or whatever. Like... Yeah, I I can agree with that. I feel like it's just disconnected in a way that like nobody just plainly flat out says the gobblers 
severed his demon from him, something, you know, he's lost something essential. And yes, yeah. I do think that they dying. completely like in the book, because it's been built up for so long about how Lyra and Pan work. When you see the demon cut away, it's like, holy shit, right. you know, and you feel that in the book. I don't feel that here at all. Right. I yeah. yeah, I agree it doesn't land in the same way. Sorry, I thought you were complaining that it wasn't even clear what had happened, but I do agree it doesn't land as like as significant. Yeah. I mean, Ma Costa's reaction and like, you know, go home to Ratter, we'll be okay. It's going to be okay. Like that crushes me. And that's like, you know, as a parent, it's like your biggest fear. Your kid getting kidnapped and then you you know, have to tell your kid like it's okay to die. Like just even talking about it, I'm getting choked up. So like it's crushing. The like that is beautiful and it's wonderful. I just like worry that it just the story just didn't do its job here with Billy in a way that I was like kind of surprised. Yeah, it almost felt like I I guess because they made Billy kind of not really there. In the book he's he's like awake. You know, he talks, but all he can talk about is his demon. Well, Tony, yeah. not Billy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He's very erratic and anxious and, like, unsettled. Yeah. In a way that makes the reader feel I think unsettled. that's exactly Whereas it. In the, yeah, no, in the TV show, he's basically just comatose. Yeah. And I totally agree that that, like, yeah. doesn't work on this in the same way. But that is what it is. That's exactly it, Caitlin. That's, like, what's missing for me is is to have Billy be weird you know and like creepy in a way it would be like ratter is that you and like reaching out for pan or something like that yeah and the the like image of him like clutching the dried fish yeah mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. pretending that it's his demon like that's fucking heartbreaking yeah. yeah and it's just like pathetic in a way that cuts you deep like, when I read that scene in the book, I get choked up every time. I've read this book a million times, and it still gets to me. You know, and that, that reveal, like, the, the plot of it, you're like, oh, shit, this is bad. Mm-hmm. It, and it's not bad because Billy dies. It's bad because of what happened before he dies. Right, which sets you up for, you know, like, what's coming. Like, yeah. we need to be terrified of this. And I don't know that this episode achieves that. But again, I don't necessarily think it's this episode. I think it's that the show has not done a great job on showing the relationship between human and demon and how important it is and how they've really kind of cut back on it. Yeah, you're right. That and and Billy not having anything to do are like the two things together, I think. Yeah. Like Ma Costa works. That's beautiful. And like the mm-hmm. singing and stuff. Great. But Yeah. It just didn't work for me. It's funny to me that none of us had this as our least favorite part when, like, clearly it didn't work really for any of us. <laughs> but, but again, I, get, I think it's because his death does work. Like, that is very sad, and they played that out very well. But what doesn't work is that the bad thing that they're doing at Bullvanger isn't that they're killing kids. It's right. that they are cutting their souls away from them, and that doesn't land at all. But because it it goes so quickly to, yeah, they killed him. I feel like they changed what was important about that scene. Mm -hmm. Like in the book, Lyra is sad that he dies or that the other kid dies or whatever. But it's not what disgusts her about Bullvanger. No. And in the book, they're almost everyone is like relieved when he dies on some level. And Mm -hmm. I mean, they feel bad about that. Which is why I liked that they had that line from from Ma Costa, like we were saying that, you know, where she was like, you can go. It's fine. We'll be fine. So so I that that everything about his death was great and heartbreaking. But again, like we said, they just didn't land how disgusting it is what they're doing to these children. Yeah, and I feel like there was a narrative connection between what's going on with Billy there and the way that, like, Lyra goes out of her way to take care of him and to bring him back and the relationship between Will and his mother Mm -hmm. um, and the way that he takes care of her and how she has, like, lost a part of herself in the way that, like, Billy has lost Ratter and it has, like, shattered him. Like, there's a good connection there. 
but the degree to which you know we don't see billy kind of playing things out in the same way that elaine is like counting the you know boards on the wall or you know doing her ocd thing billy is just like just sleepy they could have made that connection a little bit stronger Mm -hmm. and it would have resonated more i will say what the bit where lyra's walking up to the shed and there's like the fluffy fox pan and he's like whimpering and scared i really Mm. wanted to hug him and i felt very bad for him (laughs) there's some really good shots there too i feel like that's they're doing some like good horror stuff there there's a really good scene with lyra holding the lamp and you can't Mm -hmm. see her face or anything she's just like a silhouette um that looks very cool although i did love that she just found a lit lamp on the ground in this village it's like oh right right. we need lighting for the cameras (laughs) pan in this episode in general like when he looked so sad at the funeral at the end and the other demons were looking over at him that was a really good shot and you could see that Sophonax and Hester were like concerned for him. Oh, it was so good. Yeah, the whole set there, um, the second camp that they make inside of what looks like the wreckage of a dirigible or something like that is very cool looking. Like, I just like the whole design of that place. I am glad you pointed that out because I had I no idea what that was or why they were there. What was going on? I don't <laughs> think I even noticed it. <laughs> When York and, and Lyra were running up to it, with well, and Billy, I guess, I was like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> if, if you look at it, it's like roughly the shape of, you know, the balloon, but it's just the frame is left in, in their scattered pieces all over the place. And it kind of provides like a windbreak for the entire place to kind of build a camp and the bonfire in the middle. So it was just visually cool um, and looked really good the way it was lit. Everything else that I took note of is just like stupid little things that I thought were funny. Like um, Serafina's Coram, I am 300 years or more. She doesn't, she doesn't know how old she is? <laughs> like what? I mean, <laughs> once you get to be that old, maybe counting is hard. I don't know. Or it just like a single year doesn't make that much of a difference. No, you're right. It is very weird. <laughs> it's a weird ass line. Um, I really like the way that they've been building Lyra's competency and confidence in her own skills. Um, mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. feel like in the book, we got a lot of that just like straight from the get go with her backstory at Jordan College. Um, but because the TV show didn't really have the time to spend with that, I really appreciated both in the writing and in Daphne Keene's acting how Lyra is really coming into her own in these past couple episodes. Mm-hmm. I agree. And I also, I thought the part where she talks about being, you know, part bear was kind of funny because we, we had that whole conversation in the book about how she actually does claim to be Egyptian and Ma Costa has to kind of put her in her place. So it's it's just interesting the way that the show and the book are kind of treating the way that Lyra views her identity differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they even had that bit in the previous episode where Lyra is talking to uh, John Faw about York and she says, he's practically Egyptian, just like me. Yeah. And then in this one, she's like, I'm practically a bear, just like you. (laughs) So they're keeping that part of her, but they're not having people be like, actually... Maybe you're not part of this minority group that you are not actually a part of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's she's making connections. I feel like that is what Lyra is in the show. <clears throat> like somebody who builds the this like emotional network. And she's like building a family, right? She's like collecting fathers. She's got like her sensitive dad with Father Quorum and her, you know, like snarky dad with Lee and her stern dad with John Fa and her uh, problematic dad with Lord Asriel. And her scary dad with uh, York. Or not scary, but like her... Scary to other people. Yeah, scary to other people. Like, I can kill you with my hand. Right. <laughs> I think of Lee as adventure dad. I was gonna say Lee is more of a fun uncle type figure. Yeah, that's true. Mm, that's true. <laughs> did we have anything else to say or did we want to wrap it up? Do we want to talk about Moses or teleology? No, I didn't really have any strong, I didn't see any strong philosophical themes or religious themes coming out in this. I mean, she kind of listens to the voice of God here and and does what it says. 
which directly contradicts the thing I said last time. But um, <laughs> I feel like there, this is a lot of like plot, 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 plot. Like it feels like the first episode to me again in terms of like how all that operates. Yeah. And I don't think we really got Will's teleological purpose. Mm-mm. Just that he's important. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, in that case, if you want to avoid spoilers, you can leave us now um, and join us next time when we'll be talking about episode six, The Demon Cages. If you like our show, take some time to leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. I'm Anya, and you can follow me on Twitter at Strangely Literal. That's Strangely, then L-I-T-E-R-L. I'm Caitlin, and you can follow me on Twitter at Inferior Caitlin. Follow the show on Twitter at M-O-T Pod. Uh, so you can live tweet Monday night uh, on HBO at 9 Eastern Standard Time. Need more than 280 characters to speak your mind? Send your email to contact at hallowedgroundmedia.com. And now for some spoilers. Everyone's special! So this first one is like, I don't even know if I should talk about it because it's kind of a big spoiler. Do you want me to take my headphones out? Sure. <laughs> So Lee has a line in this episode where he says, is that a sensible thing to do? Look for ghosts. And like, he definitely spends all of book three as a ghost. <laughs> so I thought that that was pretty funny. I mean, that's also a movie. Ghost dad. That's a yeah. Movie. Ghost dad. I mean, kind of horrible and tragic. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, he provides a good meal for his friend. So it's fine. <laughs> right. I did not think about how that's setting that up. That's true. That's great. Uh, I think for the rest of them, I can bring on you back. So my other spoiler discussion is that in the sort of funeral dirge that they sing at Billy's funeral, I'm pretty sure it was a little bit hard to understand them, but I'm pretty sure one of the lyrics is your soul never leaves you. Which is just ironic considering, yes, yes, it does. And that's kind of the whole point of this story. Oh, I did notice that. Yeah, which is funny because they're literally cleaving your soul in half. Well, that, but also part of the whole story is that when you die, your demon does leave you. It doesn't, you, you don't end up in the same place. Oh, wow. Okay, my prediction for how they're going to end the season. You know, everything's going to happen with Azriel and opening the big old opening into the bridge yeah the bridge sure 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 into the other world and we're gonna end with lyra walking into that and will finding his window and walking into that wow that makes sense man that's a lot to do in a couple of episodes that's true Three? okay i will or i guess maybe you've watched episode six i haven't I have, I have not watched episode six and I will say, I did come up with that prediction when I thought that there was 10 episodes and that we had like four more episodes to go. And so we'd be getting more of the other world. Or of That our, would be whatever. cool, though. Yeah. That is what I would be going for if I was writing this season the way that they are writing this season. Mm-hmm. Because then we can just start season two with them finding each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. That would be really... That would be really strong. It also kind of explains why this episode is like kind of crunched. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And just the parallelism of it is like really nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it would really explain why we're spending so much time with this rando kid named Will. But the witches love him. <laughs> I guess they do have a lot to do with Will's story to get him there because they'd have to have him realize that his mom isn't being paranoid, that somebody is following them and doing stuff and because he like drops her off somewhere so that she'll be okay it ha- i mean it could all be different who knows i guess that's true he wouldn't just leave his mom so they'd have mm-hmm. to deal with her and then he'd have to kill a dude which is why he originally is like oh i can hide somewhere else because i'm a murderer <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um but i think that is everything for this week so we will see you all next week and remember to never walk when you can ride <laughs>